legislators are preparing for the 2019 Florida legislative session. Members of the local Northwest Florida legislative delegation are here and they want to know what's on your mind. We're live and interactive on radio and on television from the Phyllis and Mike Johnson studio. It's legislative review dialogue with a delegation. This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. And a very pleasant good evening, everyone. Thank you so very much for joining us. I'm Jeff Weeks. In addition to our television broadcast on WSRE TV, we're also being heard on News Radio 92.3 FM and on AM 1620. Down the road in Tallahassee, there's a new game in town. Rick Scott is off to Washington, and newly elected Governor Ron DeSantis is preparing to put his stamp on Florida's future. In Northwest Florida, our local delegation underwent change as well. With Clay Ingram being term limited out and Frank White pursuing other political opportunities, districts one and two were put into play. So what does all of this mean to the constituents of Northwest Florida? On tonight's legislative review, we hope to sort it out and we would like to have your help. This is a forum for you to ask your legislators questions about issues that most concern or interest you. You can do so by email or telephone. The email address is questions at WSRE.org. Or if you prefer, you can call us at 850-484-1223 or toll free at 1-800-239-WSRE. We're joined by members of the Northwest Florida Legislative Delegation. Senator Doug Broxson serves District 1. He is chair of the Banking and Insurance Committee. He is also on several other committees, including military and veterans affairs affairs, space, and domestic security. Senator George Gaynor serves District 2. He is chair of the Committee on Finance and Tax. Senator Gaynor will not be able to join us this evening. And now from the Florida House of Representatives, Jayer Williamson serves House District 3. Representative Williamson is chair of the Government Operations and Technology Appropriations Subcommittee and vice chair of the Workforce Development and Tourism Subcommittee. Alex Andrade is a newcomer to state politics. He is the newly elected representative in District 2. Andrade will be serving on the Commerce Committee and the Energy and Utilities Subcommittee, among others. Mike Hill is new to District 1, but not the Florida House. From 2013 through 2016, he served as District 2 representative. Representative Hill will be on the Agriculture and Natural Resources Subcommittee and the Civil Justice Subcommittee, among others. Mel Ponder serves House District 4. Representative Ponder is chair of the Children, Families, and Seniors Subcommittee. He is also the Majority Deputy Whip. Gentlemen, thank you so very much and welcome. So glad to have you. Thanks for taking taking time this evening to uh, to address uh, our viewers and listeners as we head into the uh, 2019 session. I'll begin with you, Senator Broxton. What is top of mind for you heading into 2019? Well, I think the top of everyone's mind is still Hurricane Michael. Uh, it's a storm really that has been forgotten. Right after that, we had the great fires in uh, California that kind of took the wind out of the attention that we deserved for all these thousands of people that lost their homes, their beachfront property, and over $2 billion of timber, which was the backbone of their economy. So we need to take care of that. I think we're gonna all pitch in and help our neighbors to the east, make sure that we get the funding they need, and join with our federal partners, making sure that they treat us exactly as they treated other states, such as Louisiana and New Jersey, and having a robust response to to the disaster that occurred here in October. Representative Williamson, how about you? Right, as the Senator said, obviously we have some members of the House of Representatives and, and Senators to our east that they're really hurting. Um, they went through one of the most devastating storms um, that they've had. They're representing a, a district and um, that has people that they're still hurting from the storm. So um, the Panhandle always comes together in a time of need and that's what we've, uh, that's what we've done. We wanna make sure we've, all of us here have filed appropriations for uh, people to our east, maybe not necessarily in our district, but to help out other members um, 
throughout the Panhandle, and we're going to work together to make sure we bring funding back to the Panhandle to help those storm victims and to help uh, members, um, maybe not necessarily in our district, but people that were affected by that storm. And we also need to make sure that we tell people from around the state about the storm. Uh, people see pictures um, in committees, but pictures don't do justice um, on that storm. If you've been to Panama City, if you've been to other parts of these di these districts and seen the devastation that they've had, and you've seen it firsthand, you, you know what they're going through. So we need to make sure that we're bringing people into those districts so they can see firsthand that as well, and making sure that's on the forefront front of their mind. Um, we have a lot of different things that are going to be happening in the state. We have a new governor, we have a new speaker of the house, and a new senate president. And, and it's our job as a delegation to make sure that we um, are, tell all of those people um, the importance of the panhandle and keep working together and fighting together to make sure the needs are met. Representative Andrani, first of all, congratulations. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you for coming uh, this evening. As you head into your freshman year, what's, uh, what's top of mind? Uh, top of mind for me, again, is, is hurricane micro recovery, but also uh, the water quality here in the state. There's no secret that uh, for the past year, uh, headlines across the country have been focused on Florida's water quality, uh, and Northwest Florida hasn't hasn't been immune uh, to those discussions. Uh, you know, I I want to first recognize uh, the Florida House members, Jerry Williamson and Mel Ponder, for carrying appropriations uh, for hurricane recovery for Hurricane Michael for some of those districts that uh, uh, currently are, are underrepresented. House District 7 doesn't have a state representative, so a lot of uh, Northwest Florida State Representatives have stood up and actually carried appropriations for hurricane recovery in those districts. Uh, you know, I'm excited to see uh, Jared Moskowitz, the, new sec the Secretary of Depar the Department of Emergency Management, come in and, and work with FEMA, actually get additional uh, 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 hurricane recovery relief for those, those counties that are hurting right now. Uh, and, and for me personally, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be running appropriations for, to improve water quality across, uh, you know, septic to sewer in my district and in, 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 in this county uh, and for, for uh, our estuary programs here in this county. Okay, wonderful. Representative Hill, welcome back. Well, thank you. I, I, congratulations. And what about you? What's top of mind? Well, first of all, I want to say that I am so proud to serve with this Panhandle delegation. It's a good group of conservatives that keep the conservative values in mind of championing the rights of the individual, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, equal treatment under the law, and having respect for our Constitution that limits the powers of the government. I think everyone here and part of this delegation believes in that and agrees to that, and I am so glad to be serving with them. For me, top of mind is my heartbeat detection bill, which says that if a heartbeat has been detected in the mother's womb, then that baby cannot be aborted, except for certain circumstances, rape, incest, uh, human trafficking, or if another doctor certifies that the mother's life could be in danger or a vital organ. Um, but it's a good bill. It's a bill that is gaining a lot of momentum in Florida and in other states. And so hopefully that'll be something we can get across the finish line this session. Okay. Representative Ponder, great to see you. I know you're a little bit under the weather. We appreciate you coming out and, and, oh, and, and playing yeah. sick, so to speak, yeah, yeah, playing okay. play yeah. a herd. What's top of mind for you? Yeah, and I appreciate that. Some people sound like I'm talking through a hose or something they know. Um, but, you know, for me, it's just, uh, you know, the incredible honor to serve with these other folks here in Northwest Florida. We do have, as uh, Representative Hill said, a powerful delegation, and, um, and uh, it's an honor to co-labor with them because a lot of things that we have, that, that we need the strength of each of us working with each other, uh, being having a relationship with each other, fighting as a, as a unified front. And, um, you know, Senator Broxson started off with the hurricane issue, and, and others carried on as well, Chair Williamson included, that... It's a big deal. I mean, the, the, all the cameras are on, and, and Senator Broxton hit it. We had another disaster. Cameras started turning off, and the devastation hasn't left. Uh, people are still hurting. You know, my hope is that, you know, as we, as we look to do what we can as a delegation to, to lock our arms behind them, that, that not only could they restore, but they also revive, become back stronger as much as possible. But it's a multi-year process. We need to be mindful of that um, and do our part, be diligent and faithful to do what we can to help them out. Uh, to our east, Representative Trumbull, uh, Chair Trumbull, pardon me, Chair Drake, and Senator Gaynor, as you referenced all of them, uh, you know, they, they lived it. They went through it. We had the benefit uh, to be um, hopefully a blessing to them to go into them and help them out. And so, but it's going to be, uh, it's going to take, it takes some time. But thankfully, you heard each of us say that uh, we're all in it, which is good. That, that tells you the family culture we have here in Northwest Florida, which I think is really important. Outside of that, for me, my district um, in Okaloosa is 70% uh, dependent on the military. The 70% of our economy is military driven. So I'm, I've got several military bills that continue to work with veterans, work with active duty, um, work with hidden heroes, which are military spouses. 
Um, outside of that, I'm also have the privilege to, you know, tourism is our number one generator this year in our state to, to work on a, a, a reauthorization bill for Visit Florida, which is really important to not just my district, but really all of Northwest Florida. Um, but outside of that, just to co-labor with these folks, um, hopefully um, you know, work, bring some worthwhile policy and, and appropriations back to Northwest Florida would be would be huge. So, but again, thank it's an honor to be here, and I'm looking forward to being with you tonight. Wonderful. Representative Hill, you mentioned just kind of in passing, but it, it, I think it's a question worth asking about the, you said, human trafficking. And obviously that has become a big news story here in recent days with some very high profile people in the business community and sports related figures, and I won't get into all that, uh, being um, alleged involved in um, quote unquote prostitution that may have been tied to human trafficking. What can be done? What can, what can we, because I talk to people in the medical community and it's a bigger problem than people apparently realize. What can be done from a legislative standpoint, if anything, to, to try to help curtail this? Well, I know that's something that the Florida legislature has been working on for some time. Uh, Attorney General, former Attorney General Pam Bondi, um, that was a big issue with her. And um, I know that there are several different tactics that can be taken to uh, lessen that um, horrible incident that we have going on. Um, part of it can be um, funding for those homes that will help take care of those who have uh, faced that type of abuse um, to get them out of those situations. Um, and then also um, perhaps some penalties for those who participate in that. But bottom line is, Jeff, that you're talking about a condition of the human heart. And um, that's always hard to regulate, to legislate. Um, it's just something that we have to be aware of, conscious of and making sure that we start educating our children at an early age mm -hmm. that it is inappropriate and you need to avoid it. Anybody else want to add to that? Last year we had a bill that uh, moved through the Senate, did not make it through the full legislative process, but frankly people are amazed when, when I tell them that most of the problems are not in the uh, low-end hotels, it's in the high-end around Disney. Mm -hmm. uh, where they go in and they rent these rooms, pay an enormous amount of money, and these people are trapped in there for days and weeks. The, the problem we saw is that somebody saw those people in distress and didn't say anything. So there's a bill that says, if you see it, tell it. If you're the janitor or your front, work at the front desk, then you need to report it. And I think you're gonna see that uh, Senator Book will probably represent that bill this year. And if we can get everyone to step up and, and say what they see and, and do it in a proper way, then I think we can dig into the real problems that we're having primarily in Central and South Florida. Anybody else want to add to it or feel like that pretty much sums it up? Let's move on to uh, another uh, crisis that, that not only in the state of Florida that's a problem, but nationwide, the opioid crisis. And again, this comes from a viewer. And by the way, if you are watching this evening or listening via the radio, you can call in at 850-484-1223 or 1-800-239-WSRE. Ask your question off the air. They'll get it over to me. Or you can email questions at WSRE.org. Org. So let's talk about the opioid crisis. The opioid crisis, according to one of our viewers in Florida, is a looming concern uh, even here in Northwest Florida. And this viewer says the 2017 Medical Examiner's Report lists 245 opioid-related deaths, including 30 from heroin, despite the fact that there were no heroin-related deaths in 2013. What policies are being discussed um, to mitigate the abuse of opioids in health care and on the streets? Well, I think one of the biggest issues is being addressed, attempting to be addressed by uh, President Trump, and that is securing our borders. Um, any sort of way that that can be done, because we know that a lot of the drug trafficking is coming across our southern borders. I also know that uh, President Trump has recently uh, made an agreement uh, with China, recognizing that the fentanyl, which comes from there, which is so dangerous, uh, is going to be more strongly regulated to curtail its use being uh, brought here. And a couple of years ago, the Florida legislature attempted through the medical profession to try and curtail how the uh, opioids were being prescribed, uh, trying to lessen that factor. I think we continue to do that and also secure our borders that we can start tackling this problem. Mm -hmm. I think also, uh, in addition to that, I mean, we, um, you mentioned Northwest Florida. I know my district actually was one of the one, number one counties of need in an 18-county footprint of particularly opioid abuse. Um, 
and we did pass last year's legislature, as Rep Hill talked about, uh, that would limit the number of days that a, a doctor could prescribe opioids so that we can maybe get our hands around some of the addictiveness to it and to have them come back. But one of the things I've seen is Judge Leifman's got a program out in Miami-Dade County that's a diversion program. And really, you have some of these ones that are tied up in the system that are overpopulating our jails, causing a lot of additional expenditures that taxpayers are paying for. And the truth of the matter is all they need is to be diverted out of that system into a substance abuse or mental health issue and work from that regard. Unfortunately, funding um, it doesn't follow that to the extent it should, but there's some programs where Judge Leifman's having jail pods closed down because of success, and he's curbing this, this desire um, of the addiction of opioids, and, and they're seeing major transformation, which is really good. So I think that, in addition to maybe blocking the access, is also what can we do on the back end of that? If someone's in it, how do we get them off of that so they can become a contributor to society again? Okay. Let's talk about Florida's waterways. Uh, from one of our viewers, do you agree that Florida's waterways are most or are, are one of the most vital issues facing the state? Since it not only affects tourism but uh, also in every other aspect of living here. So, what are you doing to make sure that our rivers, springs, bays, bayous, and Gulf are protected in perpetuity? Uh, yeah, I'll take that one. Go so. For it. Uh, one of the, I'm, I'm running several appropriations, but one of the appropriations I'm most proud of is my appropriation uh, to fund the, the Perdido Bay and Pensacola Bay Estuary Program. Uh, it's it's $500,000 over two years to take advantage of a $2 million grant from the federal government uh, to help improve our waterways in northwest Florida. Uh, there's no question that in the news right now nationally, there's the discussion about Lake Okeechobee uh, and the Caloosahatchee and St. Lucie Rivers down in central Florida, uh, figuring out how to curtail the, the blue-green algae uh, that we're dealing with here in Florida. Uh, I think one of the big things we need to do is actually have an intelligent conversation about the issue. Uh, we have almost a thousand people moving to Florida every single day. Over 50 percent of Floridians right now still live on septic tanks. Uh, that's pumping inordinate amounts of nitrogen into the water. Uh, that's contributing to growth in that algae and causing those blooms. Uh, so the more we can, we can invest in our infrastructure intelligently, uh, the more we can move uh, Flor Floridians, new and old Floridians, on uh, to sewer systems that can treat that water before it goes into our natural estuaries, uh, the better off we'll all be. Okay, very good. Uh, anyone like to add to that? Or pretty much sums that up. Yeah. You know, one of the things that uh, Governor DeSantis has uh, spoken about that is that he plans on focusing on is, is education and, and school choice. So a viewer question here, do you support a major expansion of school choice? Well, I think we're going to see an expansion that uh, we believe in Florida that every child deserves a quality education. And the reality is that there are some segments, some areas in every part of Florida where a person cannot get a quality education at a traditional school. So we're trying to make it available not just for the people that have the means, but for those that do not. The program originally was designed to help the poor and the disadvantaged. And I think we are going to do a better job in the next few years to make sure that, uh, like downtown Pensacola, where people cannot travel outside the city, would have an opportunity for their kids to be educated at the same level as they are in Gulf Breeze or Milton or Fort Walton or downtown Pensacola. So we have a lot of work to do. We know that it's important that we concentrate on education and we know that the better you're educated, the better job you're gonna get and the happier your family's gonna get be because it reduces a lot of problems inside the family. Anyone else like to add to that? Jeff, I would add to that that um, school choice is very important because we know not only just in schools but in any endeavor, mm -hmm. whenever you have competition, then excellence improves because of that. So uh, along with what Senator Broxson was saying, I believe we need to have available to parents the ability to choose how their children are going to be educated. That could be public school, home school, private school, charter school, internet school and let the parents choose how they know their child will best respond in those situations. And with that sort of competition, we're going to find that all of those areas will improve, thus affecting the improvement of education for our children. Mike hit the nail on the head talking about competition, and, and I would say, you know, with me representing Santa Rosa and Okaloosa County, a lot of times people, when they think about school choice, it almost has a, a negative 
um, thought because we have such good schools in Santa Rosa County and Okaloosa County, but we don't, we don't think about other parts of the state where a child gets sent to a school over and over that's a D school or an F school, and that child should have the opportunity to be able to find a school that it can go to and succeed, and they can have a life where they can prosper um, and, and, and live the American dream and have a, get a quality education. But school choice isn't always about the quality of the education. Sometimes a child has a medical issue, and I see this in Santa Rosa um, County in my district. I have children, I've had people that come to me and say thank you um, for supporting some of the things you have um, done the last two years because my child now can go to a school where they have a nurse on staff um, every hour of the day that, that they can get the medical attention they have that they don't have in the public school system. So people don't always think about it from the, the standpoint of a medical attention or a medical need that a child has, but certainly we're going to see school choice expand in the future and the people and the children across the state deserve that. Okay. Anyone? Yeah, like me along those lines. I mean, we have a, a, a new governor, as you referenced early on, uh, Governor DeSantis, and he is he's real big on this. He's real right. big on the transforming the education arena. And then you have our new Secretary of Education, uh, Commissioner of Education, pardon me, Richard Corcoran, who was the Speaker of the House. Right. He also is big on that. So, I think for us as legislators is to uh, to embrace <laughs> where we're going and just try to make make sure it's something that we that will work. Um, but you know, trying to do what's what's best for the child. You know, focus on what's best for the family. And it's already been referenced some of that. Um, in some of our schools too, I want to, um, I know Representative Williamson hit on Santa Rosa and Okaloosa, um, you know, because of Hurricane Michael, a lot of this, they've got 3,000 less kids in their school system right now because of the storm. They've been displaced. Some of them may never come back. Some are in our districts. Um, and so thankfully we do have very reputable public school up here in Northwest Florida. Now they're even stretched even further. So although some of the choice might be there for the opportunity, some of the availability to get into a school has been closed. Um, but having that and embracing where we're going, I think is real important because I think it's a, it empowers the family and empowers the child to do what's best for them. And this is, this is a testimony to the importance of this issue that all five of us are going to be speaking on it. Uh, but I want to give a shout out to Montclair, Lincoln Park, and C.A. Weiss Elementary Schools, uh, which allowed me to take a tour uh, yesterday. Uh, you know, Principal Wil Wilkins over at Montclair Elementary was describing how as her school was progressing and improving, she saw 100 new students, almost a 30 percent increase uh, in one year because mm -hmm. parents did. They wanted to take advantage of the opportunities as they saw a, a, one school improving. Um, you know, you also have, you have the Teacher of the Year in Scambia County at Lincoln Park Elementary School, uh, an, an, a historically underperforming school in, in, in School District 3 uh, that's now increasing and students want to go there. Uh, and we should, we should be empowering parents of all, of all socioeconomic levels uh, to be finding the best opportunities for their children uh, in, in, in Florida. One of the other thing, did, I'm sorry, oh. did, uh, one of the other things that uh, Governor DeSantis has uh, said is a focus of his would be uh, teacher bonuses, some sort of bonus structure for teachers. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I like what we're, we're embracing right now in the legislature. I don't know about the Senate side, but on the House side, we're looking at a few options that will take it away. One of the uh, complaints or pushbacks I've heard is the teacher bonuses have been based on uh, former SAT and ACT scores. And I think we're looking to get away from that and, and replace it with something else. Um, I do like how we do the teacher bonuses that we, we give it directly to the teacher so that it doesn't go through a system of any kind so the teacher directly receives the bonus that they've, they've earned. Um, but I do know that one of his desires was to, to create another pathway for that for the teachers and I think we'll probably see something this year in the legislature I would imagine that the House and Senate will come to agreement on to, to bring forward. And, and I hope we can find a way to, to give bonuses where it's not based directly on an ACT or an SAT score when a teacher hasn't taken an SAT or an ACT in 25 or 30 years. Um, and, and then going back to public education, we're so lucky to have such great public education in Santa Rosa um, County. I'm a product of the public education system. That maybe doesn't vouch for Santa Rosa public <laughs> schools, um, but, but I'm a product of Santa Rosa County schools, and, and my children go to the public schools, and, 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 and we want to invest in public schools and make sure we make um, those, those investments in them. But people should still have that choice. But with the bonuses, um, we, we, we need to make sure that we – we do give the bonuses and we do invest in teachers who are doing a good job. There, there are great teachers in this state. There are, in, like any profession, there are people who just do enough to get by, but there are a lot of great teachers in, in this state and we need to make sure that we invest in those teachers. But right. not just bonuses, we need to make sure that we look at salaries as well. But this is a very complex issue when you look at the state's budget, um, when you give bonuses across the board or when you give raises across the board, obviously um, you're going to be taking from somewhere else. So it's a very complex issue when you look at the state budget, but we do need to be, invest in education and I think we're going to continue to work at that. 
You know, you say that about the, the testing and putting so much emphasis on testing, and I think we've talked about this in the past, and one has to wonder, is it really fair for the teachers or for the students for one test one day right. <laughs> to, for, for so much to be put on that? Because, you know, I, I, I can remember in school coming up that I, I knew people who were very good at taking tests that really weren't all that bright or accomplished and vice versa. So, I mean, how do we figure out a better way to measure is my question. Well, Jeff, you know that uh, Governor DeSantis has stated he wants to get rid of Common Core, or as it call, it's called in Florida, Florida Standards, that he wants to get rid of that and instead go back to the more classical American type of uh, education that we had. And I've spoken to teachers before, and one of their biggest complaints is what's called the VAT, or Value Added Test, mm -hmm. um, which determines their salary, which determines um, their pay. And um, I think getting rid of this Common Core or Florida Standards type is going to remove some of that frequent testing that was being done in our schools so that the teachers are more evaluated on how their students are performing throughout the year, not just on one single test. I think, Jeff, that one of the things we've got to realize is that we have, super, uh, we have superintendents and we have school boards. And they're on the ground every day working with their teachers and students on how to navigate through their school system. I'm sure there's people out there tonight cringing that we're coming up with the solutions on how they can run their schools better. We really need to go back to a, the old fashioned system of letting people be responsible for their own shop. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know we do a good job here in the Panhandle. There are places, there are pockets around the state that have horrible issues. Uh, but we don't have those issues here. Unfortunately, when the law is passed in Tallahassee to solve a problem in Miami or Tampa or Orlando, we get not the benefit, but we get the negative benefit of, of those changes. So we would like to have more autonomy in the panhandle to be able to produce a product that we know we can produce. We're talking with our Northwest Florida legislative delegation as they prepare for the 2019 legislative session. If you have a question, you can email us questions at WSRE.org or you can call us at 850-484-1223 or 1-800-239-WSRE. So whether you're watching us on television or listening to us on the radio, we certainly would love to hear from you and find out what is on your mind. One of the other um, topics that keeps coming up in my questions here that we have received from viewers and listeners is the arming of teachers. And obviously we have had um, issues not just in Florida but around the nation with school gun violence. And where does that stand? Should teachers be armed? And I'll throw that up for a jump ball here, whoever wants to take that. Well, what we've said as a legislature is that that's up to every school district to make that decision. That is not our decision. We provided funding to allow them to have SROs or to do it the way they want to. Uh, many of them have chosen to go uh, to team up with the sheriff's office or other law enforcement to do it. There is a debate, and I think the committee that studied this said that there's no reason why teachers that are qualified to, to have a gun should not be considered as an option. It's certainly much less expensive than a full-time officer at their school, but that is not my decision, nor anyone on this panel. It's really a decision that each school board, each superintendent has to make and let the public have their input on what they want. Okay. Jeff, there was, after the horrible incident in Parkland right. last year, a commission was put together to study and come up with recommendations on how such a tragedy could be prevented in the future. One of their recommendations was arming um, school administrators, which could include teachers. Um, because if you read that minute by minute synopsis of what happened at that terrible incident, um, it should have been prevented, first of all, and it could have been stopped sooner if there had been someone there who could have stopped that shooter. And so that's why they came up with one of their recommendations. And this was from the parents who were involved in that and others in that community. So I think that there is a need to have teachers who are trained and are willing to be armed to protect the students that they love. Okay, anybody else wanna to add to that? Or? Yeah, Bill, I'd just like to contribute the, that uh, when we're talking about a solution, we need to identify the problem. And the problem is uh, you, have, you have students today 
uh, in, in schools across the state who have cell phones, who go home, who have mental health needs that aren't being treated. Uh, one of the bills I'm proudest to run right now is a, a bill to, to, to draw down federal dollars to increase mental health services in schools uh, so that the children right now who are facing bullying, who are considering suicide, uh, can get the treatment that they need and deserve uh, where they need it. Uh, so as, as long as we're, we're talking about problems, we also need to be um, you know, finding alternative solutions besides just uh, you know, the, the ultimate solution, which yeah. is, which is you know, uh, armed conflict. All right. I, I think you bring up a very valid point, and I believe there's been an awful lot of research kind of headed in that direction that uh, apparently over in recent years funding has fallen off for mental health and, and things unfortunately have escalated to the point. Let's move on and talk about uh, infrastructure, roadways, uh, the economy, et cetera here. Uh, viewer question, will the state have funding for making roads safer for pedestrians at Pensacola Beach and Pensacola proper? So I guess safety concerns about some of the roads. Anybody want to jump on that? Well, I guess that's my responsibility since I'm running the, the uh, infrastructure appropriations asks uh, for Escambia County. Um, we're working on it. Uh, I'm running three appropriation projects that, to increase uh, bike and pedestrian safety in Escambia County, one on Pace Boulevard, one on Cervantes, and one that, the, that our transportation planning organizations put out. Uh, I am also uh, uh, you know, asking the state for money on Pensacola Beach to, to improve the roadways uh, on the beach itself. Um, uh, the, the ultimate answer is it depends. It, it depends on our, our estimating conferences, how much money the state has to contribute at the end of session. Uh, but we're, we're conscious of it, and we're, we're continuing to tell that story uh, in Tallahassee that you know, bike and pedestrian infrastructure is critical. Uh, it's a critical safety component uh, of, of our infrastructure projects here in, here in Florida. And I'll I'll just, I would just add that um, you know, we have local TPOs, transportation planning organizations, that you have commissioners and, and city council um, men and city council women that sit on those organizations and, and they have um, actually people in the community that have a, a citizens um, action committee that, that meets before the TPO meets. They come up with five-year work plans and, and they, they have different projects that they work on and I would tell the person that came in with that question, find out when the TPO is meeting, mm -hmm. go to those meetings, go to those uh, CAC meetings and, and, and find out when projects are in the work plan and, and be a voice and talk about the projects and let, let your voice be heard on when you want, um, what projects you feel are important in the local community because uh, it'll, it'll make it to us and, and, and we'll hear about it too, but at the local level you can really get involved and let your voice be heard. Okay. I'll add to that just real quick, Jeff, if you don't sure. mind. I mean, I know, I know the question was pertaining to Pensacola, but I know uh, Rep. Williamson and I were in part of a meeting last summer in Crestview where we had the TPO present. We had the city, the county, um, the state, um, as well as local um, people um, to address Highway 85 going south of Crestview. It's a, it's a bottleneck every day. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things we're trying to do is we, we have a collective front between local, county, and state and hopefully triumph as well, uh, but would all come together and be able to bring that about to uh, improve that uh, for safety, for traffic, for hurricane evacuation, for military readiness, uh, all the pertinent things that's important to that. But that's a big deal there on the north end of Okaloosa County. Uh, I know they'll be leaning on uh, Rep. Williamson and I both, and probably Senator Broxson too, and Gaynor as well, kind of a full front there. Uh, but that's a big deal in our neck of the woods. And I was really excited to see the team-like approach that they took. I mean, the, because the TPO is there, but they also had every other stakeholder at the table in a public meeting, which is great to discuss it. So I'm hoping that will come to, to pass and give the people some hope there on the north end of Okaloosa. Okay, very good. Um, also on the kind of in the same realm here, what about providing funding for the uh, Beulah Interstate 10 interchange and also some of the projects at Nine Mile Road and Pine Forest Roads, obviously becoming a, a very, very busy area with Navy Federal uh, bringing so many jobs into the area? Well, that's an ongoing issue, Jeff, that uh, funding has been provided for it. It's going to take time to get that done, you know, years. Um, and I would just say that initially bringing Navy Federal here was great. It's great for our economy, um, job creation, um, and there probably wasn't enough proper planning done when you see how quickly they've grown, how uh, large they've become, which is good for us all but the planning needed for the traffic and the infrastructure. But that's coming. There's been funding now. It's in a five-year plan with the Department of Transportation to alleviate that problem. We're just going to have to be patient for a couple of years until it gets done. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah, I'll add that, that in addition to the appropriation projects I've already talked about, I'm also running an appropriation to ask for a study to be done to decide which route 
uh, the Buell Interchange should be taken. Um, you know, there, there are road widening projects on Klondike Road and Nine Mile Road that I'm also, you know, actually fighting for funding for in Tallahassee right now. Um, so, so while there's no guarantee that, that money is available, uh, we're, we're addressing that problem actively over in Tallahassee right now as much as we can. Okay, very good. Here's another economic question here. Will you be able to provide the last $25 million in funding needed for the ST Aerospace Project at uh, Pensacola Airport? School International well, Airport. I've, I've got good news. I think we've already done that. Okay. Uh, and we have to give credit to the city of Pensacola and Grover Robinson for splicing that together, getting Triumph to participate, getting uh, FDOT, plus the city and the county made tremendous commitments, right. and ST Engineering made a tr tremendous commitment. So I think that project has pretty well been buttoned up, okay. where we are going to see those 1,700 jobs, and it's going to be good jobs that will have people in this area that will have an opportunity to be trained to work there for years and years. Yeah, and I believe I believe that just was just sort of buttoned up here so the viewer had asked that question, but I believe, yeah, I think you're right on that. So it looks like it's a done deal, huh, for the most part, unless something odd happens, so, or at least hopefully. <laughs> um, one of the things that uh, Governor DeSantis has also talked about is lifting the ban, uh, lifting a smoking ban on medical marijuana. And I know that's uh, lots and lots of talk about, about that these days, not just in Florida, but around the nation. Your thoughts? So uh, I can talk on that. Last week in appropriations, we voted uh, on a bill that would um, take pre-rolled um, uh, medical marijuana, and we voted on that. So we should see a bill probably, I would say, one of the first couple weeks of session on the House floor um, because the governor did task the House and the Senate to uh, move something uh, forward. Uh, so I would imagine we'll see that in the first week or two of session. Okay. Anybody want to add to that? Well, I, I would say that I might be in a minority here, but I am adamantly opposed to smokable medical marijuana. Uh, when you study the science behind it, um, there are a lot more um, bad effects that could happen than the good effects that could come from it. Um, typically, medical marijuana, the positive effects comes from the CBD. Um, and when you smoke marijuana, you also receive the THC, which causes the euphoric uh, effect. And not only that, but also all the other carcinogens that are involved when it comes with smoking. If we're gonna use medical marijuana, it should be used, I think, in a form that is most effective, and that's in an oil form right now, where you can have high CBD and relatively low or minuscule THC. And I think you'll find also from a lot of the medical community um, a, a resistance to wanting to have this uh, smoking, mar smoking medical marijuana. Not only that, it can too easily lead to now recreational marijuana. And we have seen in other states where that has become the case, Colorado, Oregon, California, where it has been an utter disaster in those communities and we shouldn't bring that here to Florida. Okay. Here's a question from a viewer, and it's kind of a long question, but I, I think it's worthy to, to read, and uh, he's kind of explaining his uh, point here, uh, talking about alimony reform. And the question is, would you support a new bill that clearly states limita uh, limitations on alimony, both in amount and duration? He also says, will you support a bill that ends permanent alimony, with some exceptions, he's saying, for, say, medical conditions, um, uses a more formula-based system to determine what alimony payments there should be, he says, currently there are none, and also eliminates the need to carry an, an insurance policy for your ex-spouse as the beneficiary, and he puts in parentheses, in fact, forcing someone to pay alimony from the grave. Um, and anyway, it, it, his question is, it, can we create a more fair and impartial out come for the two parties involved. And I know, and, and he kind of references here, I won't continue on, but there have been some bills in the past that uh, I think have gone through the legislature and maybe didn't, were vetoed or, or didn't get signed by, by Governor Scott, whatever the case may be. So I guess it'll probably be up in the air again this year. Well, if you look at the history of the legislature, two years ago, we, we dealt with the issue. We pounded out a solution we thought was fair to all parties and we passed it in both the House and the Senate and the governor vetoed it. So the answer to the question is that if it's formulated right, if it meets all the criteria that is fair and equitable, then I think you would find that legislature would again look at that issue and see if we can find a sweet spot that changes some of the things that's 
embedded in the law that really is unfair. It's a very complicated issue. It probably was a 100-page bill that dealt with all kind of circumstances. And for us to speak directly to whether we would or not would be contingent on a lot of uh, components to the bill that uh, I haven't seen. Plus, we're all married. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to be careful what we say, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> anyway, a little levity there. Brevity there. Uh, anyway, the, uh, as far as the, the beach is concerned, this is a question from one of our viewers. What is your position on privatizing Pensacola Beach? Pri I'm not exactly sure where the viewer is trying to go I think, with that. I think that. what the viewer is asking about is fee simple yeah, and, and, the, and right. the switch from long-term leases yeah. to fee simple yeah. on Pensacola Beach. I, I think that's probably the case, yes. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I would say mostly uh, when you're talking about fee simple, that's, that's usually going to be a federal decision first. Yeah. Uh, if you're, if there, there's two issues right now. You have, you have customary use, uh, which is an issue really predominantly in Walton County, um, and then you have the issue of fee simple on Pensacola Beach. I'll say that Pensacola Beach is the only beach in the country that I'm aware of that, that operates the way that it does, uh, which causes insurance problems and tax problems. Uh, and those are issues that we need to be addressing. I'm much more concerned about the population cap that Escambia County imposes on the beach right now uh, because that, that is a much more direct protector of the character that Pensacola Beach currently has. Um, and, I'd, and I'd be much more curious uh, and much more cautious about changing the character of the beach um, before I change the legal definition of, of someone's 100 year or, or indeterminate ownership. I, I guess I would add, Jeff, just to keep it simple, um, the Gulf of Mexico and, and here in the Panhandle, we have some of the most beautiful beaches in the world. And I can say that because I've traveled to other beaches, Hawaii, uh, the south, uh, southeast and so forth, and um, they're beautiful here. And they should be accessible to our public. I would be opposed to anything that would restrict public access to these beautiful beaches. Let everyone who comes here enjoy those beaches. And, and I'd like to add, because I'm a former county commissioner and I always support it on Navarre Beach, fee simple title. If people are going to be building a 300 or 500 or $700,000 home and being pay, paying taxes or paying lease fees and paying taxes on that property, they should own that property. And people really get confused about this issue and they feel that if we're granting fee simple title um, to people on that property instead of a 99 year lease that all of a sudden people are not going to be able, able to enjoy the beach, which is not the case. And I think people have taken two issues that we've dealt with, the customary um, use issue that we dealt with last year with the legislature and then fee simple title, title and they've kind of lumped them together and, and they've created an issue that really is not an issue at all. Um, and so I think there needs to be a really an educational piece that probably we can do a better job as representatives and I think the county um, commissioners can do a better job going to the public and just articulating of why um, these, these issue or this problem that all of a sudden has been brought to us is not really an issue at all. Um, the people are going to be able to enjoy the beach if people have fee simple title on Pensacola and, and Navarre Beach. Okay, very good. Um, it, here's a viewer question. Are you in favor of allowing lower cost prescription drugs to be imported from Canada? And this, by the way, is one of the things that Governor DeSantis, I believe, has mentioned that he is interested in at least looking into. I mean, I think anytime you open the free market for that, it, it becomes attractive. In, in terms of trying to get them from Canada, that's going to be more of a federal uh, approval thing. I think that um, President Trump will need to make the final call on that one. But for us in Florida, um, prescription drug prices have, um, you know, become, they're relatively high, in some cases very high. And so I think it's up to us as a legislature to look at those and see what can we do to, um, you know, keep the quality there but also bring down costs. And so if it's looking across state lines or in this case international lines, if, if President Trump authorizes it and it gets, uh, you know, the quality of the drug I think is real important. It shouldn't be anything that's minimized to, for the care effect for the, for the recipient and the patient. Um, but for us, if we can um, you know, look at some alternative ways to bring down the cost of that to benefit the, the patient or the end user, I think is always something we should be mindful of. Okay. Um, do you feel the DeSantis proposal of a $625 million package that addresses Everglades restoration and other water-related issues will be supported and effective in addressing water quality issues? And so I'll throw that up to you there. Yeah, thank uh, you. I appreciate it. Um, I don't, I, 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 it's unclear right now if it's sufficient. My assumption is it is, uh, at least for this year. Um, we have to, we have to take a, a holistic approach. 
uh, to water quality issues in the state. I mean, we're a state that's incredibly young. And we have, like I said earlier, we have almost 1,000 people moving here every single day. Um, so the issues that we're facing uh, are, are new issues. Uh, and I'm just glad that we're looking at it, considering in Tallahassee more fully uh, this year and hopefully in the years to come. Uh, Jeff, one of the committees I sit on is um, Ag and Natural Resources, and we actually received a briefing about this issue itself. And the uh, 600 million is it's helping. It's, it's moving in the right direction. Where we've had a problem in the past is that the, the federal government was not standing up to their um, side of the, the deal of funding what was needed to protect the Everglades and some of the w reservoirs that we have in our state. The, uh, according to the briefing we received, the 600 million is a good start, but it's not enough. Um, we're gonna need much more than that to take care of the water quality issues that we have, particularly in South Florida. Okay. One, one of the issues that I think uh, uh, Representative Andrade has already mentioned is the biggest issue is septic tanks. And we have depended on the 67 counties to solve this issue. It's a very expensive issue. We, we've told the, the owners of these properties that you must convert to sewer. Well, that's easier said than done because yeah. those costs can be uh, $20,000 in South Florida. Is it now time for the state of Florida to take that as a state project rather than a county to county project? And I believe it may be because we're seeing enormous problems where we're outgrowing our infrastructure. And if we cannot serve the needs of the people, then we can't let a thousand people come in a day that we can't handle that kind of growth. So it's, it's incumbent on the state to find a way that we solve this issue. If we solve that issue, uh, the Everglades and some of the other problems that people have been accused of causing all the pollution, which is not true, will be solved septic tank by septic tank. Okay, very good. Here's a viewer question. Um, why is our legislature trying to mandate HPV vaccine for school attendance? And they quote Florida House Bill 245, Senate Bill 356 that mandates HPV vaccine for children as a requirement for school attendance. Well, a bill, <laughs> I mean, we have uh, 2,000 more bills filed. A bill does not mean that the legislature is going to do that. Right. I don't even know if that bill has been heard, okay. but it's got a long ways to go. And if that uh, listener is concerned about it, I would s suggest they send to each one of us some uh, data points that we will be in a position to speak on it in committee if it were to appear on our individual committees. Okay. Very good. Okay, here's a question from a viewer. Do you support naming the new Pensacola Bay Bridge in honor of General Chappie James? Yes. Uh, if that's the will of the people on both the, the Santa Rosa side and the Escambia side, absolutely. I, when I went to school here at Pensacola State, which Pensacola Junior College, I had the honor of having uh, Chappie James' sister uh, teach me what a great family, what a great general, what a great statement for Pensacola to have a person of this magnitude serve our country. It has, it has issues. There's, it's the easy part is naming the bridge. The more difficult part is finding a place to put a monument for. Mm. And that's the reason I took a group to Chipley to talk with DOT about placing the monument where it would go. And I think when they decide where it's going to be, and I'm waiting to hear that from the group, then we have a clear understanding of exactly what it's going to look like, if it's going to be in the footprint of the new bridge or if it has to be located in another location. Those are all important components. The naming of the bridge is probably the, the least complicated part of the whole formula. Okay. And Jeff, I would add to that, I actually filed a bill that was placed in bill drafting as a placeholder while we were waiting on um, a rule which states that if you are going to name a bridge or a road or something like that, it must seek the approval or have the approval of the local governments that are involved. In this case, it would be the cities of Pensacola and Gulf Breeze and the Escambia County and Santa Rosa County commissioners. Well, just because of timing, we weren't able to get the approval from all of those different governmental bodies. Um, and so because of that, it's going to have to come back perhaps in the future sometime. Um, but as Senator Broxson said, it's going to be important to make sure that it's done properly. 
Um, uh, General Chappie James is a great American, a great patriot. Um, he is one of the very few that when I attended the Air Force Academy and we heard uh, speakers all the time, he is one of the few who came my freshman year whose speech I still remember. Mm. He was such a riveting, inspiring speaker, uh, native son here of Pensacola, and I think he should be honored. Okay. Anybody else? Pat? Okay. Veterans Administration, question from a viewer. What is being done to truly address the shortcomings of veterans administrations dealing with veterans' disability claims? The viewer says, currently, there seems to be a lack of concern regarding any problems associated with filed claims. Staffing oversight seems to be lacking, and they say, the viewer says, perhaps it's time to hire only veterans to take care of other veterans. I know veterans is obviously a federal issue um, and we, for us at the state, but I will say one thing that I am working on with the, the new director of Florida Department of Veteran Affairs, a gentleman named Danny Burgess that served with us in the House, um, is alternative treatments for veterans. I mean, I know the VA does their part to uh, the best they can to tackle things like PTSD and TBI and things of that nature that these veterans struggle with. And so what we're trying to do in Florida is identify several key therapies that we can come alongside them in order for at the state level to partner with one of our universities or colleges to work on these alternative treatments to, to better serve the veterans that are su struggling. But uh, I believe the viewer's question probably would be better answered at the federal level, not the state level. Um, but I know the state, I know all of us embrace the military. Obviously, Mike served himself. Um, and so we want to do our part to, to honor the military. We're the most recognized military-friendly state in the country. Uh, we want to continue to further that effort. Here's a question uh, regarding home rule. It says, a recent editorial published in the Pensacola News Journal expressed concern that the legislature is undermining the authority of local governments. Where do you stand on home rule, especially in regard to legislation restricting local authority over a wide range of issues such as regulating short-term rentals, prohibiting bans on plastic bags, regulating noise ordinance, and the regulation of tree removal? I'll, I'll take part of that, right? I mean, uh, as, I, as a former mayor serving at local government, I'm a big fan of home rule. I think it's really important. Um, for me, how I look at it is I kind of say if it affects the DNA of the city, then I think it, uh, it is something I probably could not support. Uh, there's some things if you go, we have 412 different cities and 67 different counties, and if we had 500 different rules across the, the, the state, it's going to be hard driving around. But if you, uh, like the short-term rentals, I did not support the last two years just simply because I felt if you start making every home uh, an Airbnb or a rental property, it can affect the DNA of a street, a landscape. You don't know if your neighbors, you know, if they're renting it out and if you have kids. It's just, I think it affects it from that regard. But I think it's important that, you know, it's not all cities are meant to look the same. And that's why we choose certain cities to live in or certain communities or neighborhoods. And so therefore, I think the DNA of a community is really important for us to preserve and protect. And so, but at the same time, if we find something that um, it makes common sense, uh, like we did with Uber a few years back and things that we, we don't need 400 different rules, we need one that's statewide, then I, I do see where preemption makes great sense from that regard. Uh, but my, my barrier, my, or my thermostat, I guess you could say, is when it comes to affecting the DNA of a community. How about, oh, go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to say, I tell commissioners this all the time, and I think I can say this because I'm a former commissioner and my grandfather was a commissioner and my dad was a commissioner, but if you don't want the state to step in, and um, get involved, then don't make stupid ordinances. And if my kids are up this late watching, they're going to get on to me when I get home for saying the S word. But like, don't don't overstep boundaries. And people will say all the time that you know government um, closest to the people is the best government. Well, bad government that's closest to the people is still bad government. And there are a lot of people across the state, whether it be city council or whether it be county commissioners that are making some bad ordinances. It doesn't happen here in Escambia County a lot. It doesn't happen in Santa Rosa and Okaloosa County, but across the state, there are a lot of times where they really overstep the boundaries and get in, in they overstep the boundary and they take away people's freedom, and that's when the state has to get involved. So home rule is kind of one of those things where, yeah, I believe in home rule, but sometimes the state has to step in whenever a local government goes too far. You know, a perfect example of that, and I agree with uh, uh, Representative Williamson, is we have some cities and some counties in Florida which are sanctuary cities, sanctuary counties, where we know that there are those who are harboring illegal immigrants and preventing them from being arrested by ICE. So that's an example of bad home rule where the state is going to need to step in and do something about it. Something else perhaps related to that is a bill that I'm running to protect our monuments to our, our, so, our soldiers and our heroes, that there are some counties, some cities in this area who want to remove 
uh, monuments and statues of our soldiers and our heroes. And what my bill would do is give a uniform uh, uh, method away for those cities and counties to say whether or not they're going to remove those statues. Have about one minute, uh, yeah, Senator Just very briefly, I would have rather seen that editorial in June when after we met because they're talking that as if we did it. And frankly, that's just a proposal by one senator on an idea he had that may never be heard and certainly may never become law. Okay, very good. Um, Here's one I'm just going to throw up because I know it has nothing to do with you guys, but it's just funny, okay? From a viewer, it says, when are we going to get an Auburn license plate? <laughs> so <laughs> we, actually this year. We, um, we worked on that the last two years, and we had it, um, no pun intended, right at the goal line. And, um, and we came up just short, but we're going to go after it for the third time this year. And I, I, I think we're going to be close, I hope. Okay, we always okay. Had it. Okay. Well, we have a big announcement probably <laughs> next week on a license plate that we're doing that be very sensitive to this area. So okay. I think uh, uh, our team are, will come out with a statement on what we plan on doing, and it's going to be good for our region. I each one of you, give me 10 seconds. What are you most optimistic about as we head to the 2019 legislative session? Senator well, Rice. I think the new governor has really come out in a sprint, and I've met with him a couple of times. He and his wife, Casey, Casey are kind of uh, team working. They're great people. They believe in Florida. And uh, I believe we're going to see great things, great leadership from our new governor. Representative Williams. I'm, I'm excited to work with the, the new team here and get to know these guys better and look forward to going back to Tallahassee and protecting your freedom and protecting your wallet. Andrade. With that new governor, I'm excited to see uh, what Halsey Brashear says at DBPR, the Department of Business and Professional Regulation. Uh, you know, he's a former state representative of HT7 and, and seeing a uh, uh, what he can do and what the governor can do, injecting some more free market reform in our regulated industries is something I'm very excited to see. About 15 seconds each, Representative Hill. Um, what I'm excited about is Governor DeSantis has said that if we get that heartbeat detection bill to his desk, he will sign it into law. And what a just, just a position that would show of Florida protecting life as opposed to New York, which is uh, celebrating infanticide. Mm -hmm. Uh, just as we mentioned, I'm, I'm very thankful to see our new governor has not forgotten Northwest Florida. Been out here multiple times working with the president and local officials to strengthen us in our areas where we're hurting. Also working with the new uh, uh, director at Florida Department of Veteran Affairs to make sure that Florida stays the most friendly veteran and military state in the country. Thank you so much. I know you're a little under the weather. Thank That's you for right. coming out. Okay. <laughs> Thank all of you Thanks. for coming out. We'll look forward to having you come back and visit with us after the session, kind of break it, break it down and see where things all um see where everything ends up. Great. So best of luck to you as you head into the 2019 Florida legislative session. Thank you so very much for watching and listening this evening. Very special thanks to our viewers and listeners and constituents. We appreciate all of the questions that you sent in to us. Our guests this evening have been members of the local Northwest Florida legislative delegation. Senator Doug Broxson and Representatives Jayer Williamson, Mel Ponder, Mike Hill, and Alex Andrade. We would also like to mention that WSRE would not be able to produce programs like this one without the support of viewers like you. This evening, as a matter of fact, in just a couple of moments, WSRE's spring membership drive will begin with a special show featuring our Studio Amped concert series. So we certainly hope you'll stay tuned for that. Tonight's broadcast has come to you from the Phyllis and Mike Johnson studio over the airwaves of WSRE television, PBS for the Gulf Coast, and also News Radio 92. 2.3 FM and AM 1620. I'm Jeff Weeks wishing you all the very best. And in closing, we would like to extend our condolences to the family of one of WSRE's most respected former host, Shirley Aronson. For over two decades, she was the local face of WSRE television, hosting many political oriented and public affairs programs, as well as broad ranging interview shows. I'm told she was tough and a well-prepared interviewer and not afraid to challenge her subject when needed. I'm also told she did it with style and grace. Shirley passed away in late January of this year. She lived a vibrant and productive life and was a positive influence on her family and community.